Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this presentation. So for the last presentation of this day, we're going to talk about PowerPoint as a heart of, the, of a Linux-based audio system. Um, just to present myself before, my name is Philippe Bianglionek, and I work at Starwatcher Linux. So we are basically a consultancy company uh, that do BSP, middleware, and application, mainly on a Linux system, as said in our name, but also on other operating systems, such as Zephyr. And today, um, I'm going to focus a bit about our activities about audio systems, uh, because we have multiple customers uh, in this type of field, in this field. And before diving into PipeWire as the heart of this audio system, I'm going to give a bit of context about uh, what, is, uh, what are the audio systems we are considering and why we are trying to use PipeWire. So audio became very complex in the last 10 or 20 years uh, due to the rise of digital interfaces and not just analog interfaces like before. It was pretty simple in, in the analog world uh, to mix and process signals with uh, passive and active components. Now we have multiple asynchronous audio interface. We have a SPD for a multimedia in, a, in your living room. We have USB audio, we have Bluetooth, we have network connections. Uh, we need to run that, but also some advanced algorithms, such as acoustic sound cancellation, noise reduction, uh, sometimes with uh, artificial intelligence running in the background to help with this pr processing algorithm. And everything must be run in real time uh, because we don't want to miss uh, any packet of audio. Uh, for example, if you are not able to process uh, every audio five milliseconds and you are trying to process chunks of five milliseconds of audio, you lose sound, you either have a silence or noise, and both cases are kind of considered bad in audio systems. The good news is that components today are more modern and are, make it easier to implement complex audio systems. Mostly, we know of different families of system on chips, uh, the IMX, the STM32MP1, uh, Renaissance RZ um, so system on chips too. Uh, that basically have everything integrated on chip. So we have uh, DSP core processors directly integrated in the forms of DSP cores or microcontroller cores with DSP uh, instruction sets. Uh, we even have DSP extensions for instruction sets in the ARM cores, so with Neon instructions. Uh, we also have the equivalent in uh, the x86 world. And uh, we have directly integrated on chip different interfaces, so the standard interfaces for audio, which is uh, I2S and TDM. So digital audio interfaces, but also some uh, more direct, directly usable interfaces, such as SPDIF controllers uh, for direct communication with uh, audio video receivers, your television, or whatever device you want. And USB controllers are also directly integrated, which can be used also for audio. Uh, so this is pretty great, because this means that everything is integrated on one chip, which makes uh, the work easier for hardware developers. Um, and on these systems, you can usually use advanced operating systems, such as Linux, for example, uh, instead of using some very specific operating system for DSP cores or microcontrollers. And Linux being very used uh, over the world, you have a lot more large developer pool and way more open source resources that you can use to implement your system. So this makes it much cheaper and shorter to develop your products. When we're talking about Linux and audio, um, I'm going to give a very broad overview of what is audio on Linux, uh, just giving, staying at the surface. The lowest level is Alza, which are the drivers. So the dri drivers are basically everything that controls the hardware from uh, the digital audio interface, but also the external codecs on your board. So Alza controls both the data flow and the controls of your codecs. Basically, in the, um, in the embedded world, we have ASOC, so Alza for system on chips which divides the drivers in three types of drivers. You have the codecs, which are the independent drivers for the codecs that you put, the components that you put on your board, the digital audio interface drivers, which are the digital audio interface on your system on chip, which is independent from your board, and you have a machine driver, which makes the link between the two. But like every device on Linux, only one application can access it at, at the time. And sometimes you may want to use two applications that play sound at the time. For example, um, you are listening to some music uh, on Spotify, uh, and then someone is calling you on, a, I don't know which application, for example, Jammy. You need to hear uh, the, the ring bell so that you know that you have a, a call. Then you need to have some sound servers. So sound servers basically are applications that proxy higher level applications to a single uh, audio interface. They basically can merge sounds and uh, root sound to other interfaces. The idea is that they have the middle layer that link higher level audio API, so higher, higher audio level applications, to the hardware, and they allow concurrent access to devices. There are two solutions uh, 
today on the market, today with uh, small codes. It's Jack, which is very used for real-time audio processing uh, and, um, create and by music creators. And Pulse Audio, which is very used in the desktop world, uh, which is pretty much plug and play, uh, can be very extensible, uh, but has very high latency, so which is not really usable for complex audio systems, which require some real-time processing. And now there is a new kid on the block, which is called Pipewire, which has been there for now a few years, but they're starting to get uh, very, really important. Uh, so that's what we are going to talk about. Of course, the software doesn't solve anything, so I did a full talk last year with huge schematics um, about the complexity of implementing audio systems. And to give a bit of a conclusion, it was that ideally, we want to have a single synchronous interface when we work on Linux with uh, audio uh, for two reasons. First, we have, want to have any, everything synchronous because we don't want to have to resynchronize uh, different audio streams on the system on chip. Um, for example, let's say that you have uh, one stream which is at 48 kilohertz and the other at uh, 44 kilohertz. That's, uh, that's the sample rate. If you try to mix the two streams, uh, you are not able to because at some point you have more samples on one side than on the other side. So you will have one, either one buffer that overflows or the other that underflows. So you have noise and audio cuts. And we want to have a single interface because of the behavior of uh, Jack and Pulse Audio, which basically, um, I uh, get to, uh, back to it a bit later, but basically they want to resample everything uh, to make sure that everything is synchronous, even if they are actually synchronous on board. Then again, um, you can have multiple diff different interfaces, such as USB, Bluetooth, audio over network, which we will not talk too much about today, except USB, because they are a bit different to integrate. And one solution to have that would be to, for example, in hardware, to have a dedicated DSP to merge and resynchronize everything. But this is obviously uh, very expensive in terms of hardware. Another solution would be to have a very specific machine driver that you need to develop, but this can be very complex uh, with the complexity of the audio system. And you will not always have, the, for example, the hardware uh, resamplers needed to resynchronize uh, different streams. So this is basically uh, one of the questions we had um, last year, was that uh, Pipewire could actually, maybe, in the long term, uh, solve some of these issues. Uh, and it was not, in fact, in the long term. It was pretty short term. So this is a real title of my talk, which is how my previous talk was nearly obsoleted by Pipewire. And uh, this work will be based on uh, my two interns uh, work. Uh, they did really great work in integrating Pipewire and uh, studying in Sidmit. So we have Elinor and Tin, which worked with us uh, last year and the year before. And uh, this is uh, the result and the work. So first, what is actually Pipewire? So Pipewire is not just a sound server, it's a multimedia server. Pipewire was actually advertised first as a Pulse Audio for video devices. So also for cameras and displays so that you could route different cameras to different displays and to different applications. It was started in 2000, 2015, so it's pretty recent. Um, and it offers a very flexible graph approach for multimedia, which is very nice because it's very easy and intuitive to configure uh, when you just see a graph and you can plug different uh, devices and applications to other blocks. It offers a highly modular and extensible daemon, a bit like Pulse Audio, so it's very easy to add some extensions and to develop for it. Uh, at least easier than uh, having a monolithic block, but it's also able to achieve very low latencies, which is very important for uh, industrial devices. Pipewire, why would we want to use it for audio if it was not designed for this? Because with time going, uh, audio support was integrated in Pipewire and it was integrated pretty well. Uh, it integrates very well with Jack and Pulse Audio uh, applications because it's actually API compatible with both solutions. Meaning that I can replace my Jack Sound server with Pipewire or my Pulse Audio with Pipewire and keep the very same applications running. For example, on my, on my machine, I replaced Pulse Audio with Pipewire. I did not change any other application. I can still control my settings and everything as if I was with, uh, with Pulse Audio, but it's not the same sound server. It's able to meet real-time requirements, which is very good for industrial audio and for applications. Uh, it has some support for GStreamer application, which is very nice in the embedded world, uh, because now a lot of uh, vendors supply their uh, support for GStreamer applications. And it has a very active development and community. For the little story, um, Pipewire went from no support for Bluetooth, for Bluetooth to the best support for audio Bluetooth in uh, Linux in about just a few months ago, which is a huge achievement, because it was a very complex stack, stack to implement. We still had some open questions, uh, even with this, such as, well, 
what is the performance we can actually expect on an embedded platform, uh, what problem will it solve uh, that we could not solve before or not easily solve before, and what new feature uh, is it possible to bring with Sparkwire. So just to give a bit of the how we worked, uh, we evaluated it on a real board. Uh, so this is an IMX8 board from NXP uh, with a codec board with uh, six inputs and eight outputs. And we are, when using this board, it's just one codec. So at that point, it's just very synchronous. We don't have any asynchronous interface. So no resampling needs to be done at that point. We use the uh, Linux IMX uh, version 4.5.4. Uh, version 5.4. Uh, distribution was based on Yocto, so it's still pretty recent and actual in terms of uh, technology. And the use case we tried to evaluate was a karaoke application using an application called Kamiya DSP. So it's developed in Rust, and the main interest is that you can configure a DSP pipeline uh, with just a configuration file. Uh, the main feature that we wanted to see was support for both Jack and Pulse Studio backend. Why? Because this enables us to have a single application to benchmark the performance of multiple sound servers, and then just by replacing either Jack or Pulse Audio by PipeWire, we can even benchmark them against PipeWire and see the performance results. We did two types of measurements, so first the CPU consumption, and then the latency. So this is a graph of the karaoke application, just to give an example. It's actually very simple, even if it doesn't look like it. Uh, we just take the, all the input channels, which are, can be plugged to some microphones or instruments or different uh, music players. We mix everything into two channels, then we route them to eight, ch eight channels, and then we emulate a 7.1 setup, so kind of a home cinema, with a low-pass filter for a subwoofer, and everything else is routed to virtual uh, surround speakers. So the goal is not to develop a DSP application, because this is not the added value of this work. Uh, it's more to just have a benchmark uh, and a common benchmark between different sound servers that we can reuse uh, without too much bias. The first uh, measurement we did was to compare PowerPoint with Jack uh, in both terms, in terms of both latency and CPU load reduction. Uh, just a forward because you could expect the latency to be the same for the same uh, audio, packets, uh, audio packet size. Uh, we measure latency not just as the latency that, um, that the sound server is working with, but as the end-to-end -end latency from the analog input into the audio codec to the analog output. So this is why the latency can be different if there is some overhead to, to access the audio device. The main result we see is that we actually measure a performance reduction in both the server load, so in the core uh, process of uh, Jack versus PipeWire, but also on the Kamiya DSP load, uh, which is actually very interesting for us because for our customers, which can be limited by a Jack solution or which are uh, kind of stuck with uh, a lot of applications running, gaining just a few percent of CPU is already huge. It was a bit harder to measure for Pulse Audio, simply because Pulse Audio is not made for low latencies, so it would be very unfair to treat it uh, the same. So what we did for this, uh, for this measurement and this comparison with Pulse Audio was to measure the latency with a Pulse Audio server, which measured about 60 milliseconds of latency for the very same uh, DSP pipeline. And we quickly saw that Pulse Audio is not able to compete in this space, uh, which is already a first result. Uh, it means that if you want to have low latency audio applications, Pulse Audio is not a choice for embedded systems. And to make the measurements fair, we configured Jack and Pulse uh, and uh, PipeWire to have the same end-to-end -end latency uh, in the pipeline. So we configured the buffer for uh, an equivalent latency, and we did the measurement of the c CPU load at equivalent latency. What we could see is that well, we find again the results that Jack has a higher consumption with PipeWire when we replace uh, Jack with PipeWire. So we use the Jack API to communicate with the Jack backend of Kamiya DSP. For Pulse Audio, it's a bit different, and we actually see a higher uh, CPU consumption. This higher CPU consumption is actually a bit tricky, because to communicate uh, with the Pulse Audio backend of Kamiya DSP, we needed to run a second process called PipeWire Pulse, which makes the link between Pulse Audio clients and PipeWire as a PipeWire daemon. And this this uh, client, uh, this second process adds to the CPU consumption and makes it higher uh, CPU consumption. Uh, note that this was an in, uh, uh, a first integration and it's very possible, and we'll see it later, that configuration can be, uh, can be improved to further reduce the CPU consumption. So the previous uh, experiments that were, that were done by TIN uh, and now it's more than one year, one year ago, uh, 
highlighted that PyPower actually has good performance. Even if it has a bit more CPU consumption than Pulse Audio, it can replace it in the embedded audio system to reduce the latency, which can be fine, which can still be sufficient for some use cases. So it still has some interest to replace Pulse Audio in embedded systems. And for Jack, it has a lot of interest. Uh, yet, the evaluation we did at that point was using a single interface, so no asynchronous interface and not too much complexity. What we wanted to do was to also use the SPDIF block of the, our IMX uh, board and the USB block of our ISP, uh, IMX board um, using a USB gadget interface and see how PowerPoint behaves uh, with different asynchronous interfaces. To give a bit of background, uh, in Pulse Audio, Pulse Audio will try to resample everything to the same sample rate to ensure that there is no uh, desynchronization. With Jack, it's a bit more tricky because Jack will only link with a single audio interface. And if you want to use other audio interface, you need to run a specific client which will resample the, uh, the samples from this, this other interface and link them with the Jack server. So this adds a lot of CPU consumption. With PowerPoint, it's a bit different because when you configure uh, your different interfaces and your daemon, you can actually use a property called clock name to name the clock that is used for an audio interface. And this is interesting because that this means that you can manually tell PyPoyer this interface and this interface actually have the same clock and you do not need to resample between them. This is very important because this is what will enable to reduce the CPU consumption of uh, PyPoyer for complex audio systems. So with that in mind, we uh, wanted to measure what was the impact and what could we expect as a performance improvement. What we did was first to do some uh, loopbacks between USB and our, uh, our audio card, which uses a CS42448 um, uh, codec. And we did different loopbacks with different frequencies. So the first one, we wanted to force a resampling to be done. So we used a different sample rate for the, uh, for the codec board and, uh, and, the, and the, USB, uh, the USB interface. For the second uh, loopback, we used the same the very same sample frequency. Not that, again, this is a nominal sample rate. This is not the same clock um, in terms of hardware. The USB block and the digital audio interface do not have the same clock. They do not derive from the same PLL. So it will not be a synch uh, synchronous clock, even if it's the same nominal frequency. And then to have a bit of, um, of, a, of a basis to compare again, we just did some simple loopbacks with just the codec, so the inputs uh, directly on the output at different frequency. And because there is also a configuration we wanted to test, which is the sample rate of the PyPyre graph, which is the sample rate used internally by PyPyre, and to see how this configuration could impact our performance. To measure this, we used HTOP to measure the global CPU usage. We use Perf to measure the CPU usage by specific functions, which are the, well, the, the different functions used for resampling. The type here can be different depending on your target. For us, it was Neon, because we are using Neon DSP instructions on ARM64. And the results are pretty much what we expected. So in the first case where we have uh, for the USB 44 kilohertz and 48 for the codec board, we have resampling that is done. So we have some perf samples related to resampling. This is expected. We have less uh, CPU consumption for the resampling when the frequency is the same, but we still have some because as I explained, these, these are not the very same 48 kilohertz clocks. These are still different clocks. Uh, still, it's a bit better because there is something that uh, needs to be used uh, is not the same function, which apparently consume less CPU. If we use a different graph frequency, we still have some resampling, even if the interface uses the very same uh, so the very same hardware clock, because we still need to convert for PyPyre to use uh, for its internal graph to a different frequency. And then what's interesting is that here, you ca we can actually completely remove, if we indeed mark that the clock name property is the same, we can indeed remove up to 30% CPU consumption with proper configuration uh, with, uh, with PipeWire, which is very interesting. Because this means that it's possible to reduce something, but also that the configuration is key and that just installing PipeWire and expecting it to work out of the box is not enough. So now, how can we improve this performance for uh, and make it uh, and use it everywhere? There are basically two ways uh, for the digital auto interfaces we intend to use. Uh, to have the very same, I mean, audio clock that the, our system uses. The first would be to use dedicated hardware asynchronous sample rate converter to con make the sample rate conversion in hardware uh, instead of in software. The second would be for the USB uh, to use a different type of protocol, but I get to it uh, to back to it a bit later. 
Uh, here is a schematic of uh, SPD receiver. What I really want to show is that here we have a block which is clock and data recovery. What I want to insist on is that for many and pretty much all digital interfaces, the clock is embedded with a signal, which means that you cannot just put the same clock as your system here and expect it to work all right. Uh, you will need to get the clock from the interface and to convert the sample rate, uh, which is, can be done with hardware, uh, with hardware components. Uh, but we will see that there are other methods, especially for USB. And for USB, especially, uh, I want to, uh, to show how it works to use uh, asynchronous transfers with feedback and how it can be used to avoid any resampling. Basically, when you do some USB audio, traditionally, you, you used uh, what is called isochronous transfers, so it's very regular packets every milliseconds for a full-speed USB. Uh, and the clock, the audio clock, will be generated from a signal which is called the start of frame, uh, which will basically be the, the frequency uh, in uh, between codes of, the, of your USB uh, interface. And the clock will be completely synchronous with this start of frame, but not with the audio interface. So you will need to do some resampling because it's not the same clock. If you want to use some more recent uh, norm of USB, so with asynchronous transfers, you can use what is called a feedback endpoint. So this is a, an endpoint that must be implemented uh, in the kernel that basically is exposed to the uh, USB host uh, on the other side, and where you can basically tell, hey, I have too much audio samples, send less samples, or in the reverse, you can say, I don't have enough audio samples, please send more. And then you can clock the interface, you can just use your audio interface as normal, you just have to feed correctly this feedback endpoint uh, and to properly support it. There is a trick with the feedback endpoint in that you need to have support in the kernel, uh, which is done for a while now, uh, which has not been the case for other operating systems. Uh, but you still need to have some support in the user space so that you, your application can actually feel this feedback endpoint and inform the host that it needs to send more or less samples. And so far, the only application in user space that supported this well, was Alza Loop, which just did a loop between input and output. Uh, and since very recently, there is also PipeWire. Uh, I mean very recently because this was actually Elinor's uh, internship subject. And uh, when she asked on IRC uh, for which of the approach she imagined would be the best, the answer was, oh, we just did it and merged it two days ago. Uh, so <laughs> yay for open source, but did not make our work easier. <laughs> Uh, well, a bit, but I see we'll see it later. So we evaluated this solution with PipeWire uh, using the same loopback with, between USB and the codec board, both with isochronous transfers, so no feedback endpoint, and with asynchronous transfer with feedback endpoint. What's interesting is that, well, it works. We don't have any resampling to be done because now we use the very, the very same audio sample rate. And it's pretty easy to, uh, to set up in place. The only constraint is that the nominal sample rate must be the same. So you need to have 48, kilo, 48 kilohertz, for example, on both sides. We see a very slight increase of the PyPyre CPU usage, which is mostly due to PyPyre having to compute the value to put in the feedback endpoint and having to put it in the USB uh, feedback endpoint. So with this in mind and with PyPyre having actually done the job we wanted to do, uh, we asked ourselves, well, may maybe we can work on the SPDIF interface and its integration uh, with hardware resampler. So I've been talking about resampling for a while, but I haven't explained a bit of on purpose what is actually resampling. Resampling is pretty simple in terms of principle and very hard to implement. Basically, you upsample your audio samples uh, to a very high rate, so you have a lot of samples. Then you may you pass it through a low-pass filter, so you have a near analog signal, and then you just resample it, so you have the new value of samples uh, to the frequency you want. Except that this filter is very hard to, to efficiently implement, um, and it will always consume CPU because you need some very sharp filters to have good audio performances. So an idea is, why not use some hardware sample rates, which are already integrated in the, in the ICs? There are multiple families which embed some. Uh, the main problem is, uh, again, uh, the software support, and vendors don't always do a great work with that. So Linux IMX has a very specific micro API so that it can be used in the user land. Uh, this micro API doesn't exist in the mainline kernel because there is very little chips that could be compatible. Uh, so the way to do it in the mainline kernel would be to have a specific machine driver for your platform and your device, which can be very complex to implement, so not a lot of people do it. There is an example from uh, NXP, uh, but it's pretty limited. What we wanted to do was take this example from NXP 
and use instead of the uh, serial audio interface that is used as interface, uh, our uh, SPDIF interface. The SPDIF interface in Linux is a bit weird, is that there is a digital audio interface which has a uh, driver for digital interface, but for the machine driver it does not have a codec, so we use a dummy codec. And so we integrated that, we wanted to in do this work in the kernel, so what we did as a step, as a first step was to extend the machine driver for NXP with the asynchronous sample rate converter for the dummy codec, and as a second step, replace the digital unit interface by our SPDIF controller. There are a few difficulties with the routing in the, uh, in the audio route, but it's, more, it's done now. We had some noise with one specific codec that we cannot explain why, but it's in being investigated. The main issue we have is that there is no DMA script ex existing in the IMX SDMA firmware for exchange between the ISRC and the SPDIF. Basically, and to keep it short, the ISRC will use a single, a single FIFO for all samples with uh, interleaved data and the SPDIF controller will use one FIFO for the left channel and one FIFO for the right channel. So if we try to use the driver as is, uh, every data will go to the left channel and we just have sound that is two times slower and just sound on the left channel, which is not what we want. Uh, this is not what we want, but we still remove the resampling even if we don't have the, ri the right uh, sound. So this is, the idea is good in principle, we still have a need to fix the implementation um, to, uh, so that we, uh, we can have our objective, which is actually to contribute this back to the mainline kernel. So we pushed the first stack for the dummy codec support, uh, which is actually a bit problematic because the dummy codec is supposed to be a test codec and is not supposed to be used in different platforms. So we are going to have to find a solution to work around this. So to wrap up a bit the presentation, um, basically what I wanted to say is that the way that we develop audio systems has evolved a lot and now we can use Linux as a solution. Uh, Pipewire is now ready for production use. Uh, two years ago, I said to a, uh, to a customer, uh, it may be a bit too early now to use it, and now I'm saying them, maybe you should pass to Pipewire. It went much faster than, uh, than we expected, to be honest. It actually solved multiple problems that we met in real-world time, in real world audio systems, and typically the resampling issues, and proper USB support, which was basically um, inexistent for asynchronous transfers before Pipewire implemented it. And also, you can, uh, if you really want a single interface, you can do it through different Pipewire plugins. We can use it to free up some CPU resources for more processing, which is very important for some devices. Uh, I'm thinking of a customer which really have 90% CPU usage on all their cores, uh, which is a lot. And so today, I can confidently say that it can be the heart of modern audio systems. Still, it's not always over. Uh, what's the future for audio on Linux? So, for us, it's pretty simple. We'd like to finish the work on the ISRC integrations for the sample rate as the integration with IMX. Um, with known limitations uh, that we know this is an IMX specific solution, and of course this won't work on STM32 or anything, so this is a pretty limited solution. And because of the DMA script issue, this may take time to stabilize. So this is kind of blocking for us if, uh, if we don't have a solution, or we need to manually uh, fix this and and work around this, which can be a bit, uh, which have, can have worse performance. And there is another project which exists now in the Linux world, which is uh, Linux Sound Open Firmware, uh, which I was actually a bit critical about in the last uh, edition. Um, I, I said it was not ready yet, and now it's getting much better in shape. Basically, the idea is that you can offload some audio processing to a DSP core. Uh, which was originally an extensor DSP core on Intel platforms. It has been ported on IMX platforms. And recently, they decided to switch from the extensor OS as a base to Zephyr OS, which means that theoretically, uh, in a few months to a few years, we could use sound open firmware on any platform using any platform supporting Zephyr as the coprocessor. So there has been work on, from NXP to use a different Cortex-A on the system on chip as a on the sound open firmware DSP. Uh, SC has shown interest for Cortex-M firmware, so for the microcontroller coprocessor. So I'm pretty hope, uh, hopeful that at some point we will not need any hardware asynchronous sample rate converter because it will be possible to be done in DSP uh, directly on chip. Which concludes this presentation. Uh, basically, as I said, audio system development has evolved a lot. We don't, need, we don't strictly need a dedicated DSPs anymore. We can use some general purpose chips which is a big change because it is much cheaper uh, to develop for. Uh, more than ever, Linux is a prime candidate. Basically, the fact that 
real time is nearly integrated now in the kernel that we have a lot of support for different interfaces for connectivity options it's really great for us proper code design is still required i mean that in a we still can't just put every interface we want uh, without thinking a bit about how we are going to integrate this in software. So it's still important to think about this. But PyPoyer gives way more options and makes it a lot easier to implement. So yeah, in the end, uh, can PyPoyer be the heart of a Linux audio system? Yes, it can. Thank you for your attention, and I'm available for any questions you may have. Hey, so I was looking in the current um, Linux tree, and there seem to be both ASRC and EASRC in upstream right now. So what is exactly missing? OK, I think you're talking about the, yes. The audio some, sample rate converter. Yeah, in, the like sound, in the sound folder, in the sound subfolder, there is indeed some support yeah, in, for In sound, SOC, yeah. FSL, like both of them are there. So yeah. what exactly is missing? This is the driver level. So we can actually, in the mainline kernel, implement a machine driver which uses the hardware sample rate converters oh. uh, because the driver exists. But if you want to use it from the user space, we need to have a, a micro API to, to, to have this. Currently, it's integrated in the ASOC system. So what we will need to, uh, what it will expose is an audio device that will do the resampling in hardware, but you do not, do not have control over this resampling. It's basically in the pipeline. So you have your digital audio interface, your hardware resampler, uh, which uh, shows the PCM interface to your, uh, to your user side. But you do not have, like, for example, in Linux IMX, it's a bit different in that you have a dedicated micro API so that you can actually um, develop an ASAP plugin which directly controls the hardware uh, sample rate, and which direct can directly send from memory data to this to this uh, hardware sample rate converter and get it back from it. While in the kernel, it will basically send with the Alza, uh, Alza lib, it will send data to the hardware sample rate converters, but then it will send the data from the hardware sample rate converter to the digital audio interface. So yeah, FreeScale are currently working on getting the micro API that you're talking about there upstream. They're working on putting it into the V4L API because that is a better fit than ALSA. Uh, but yeah, the, hopefully that, that limitation should be addressed soonish. Okay, so we are going to understand too well with the mask. Oh, very sorry. The, you, the, the micro API you're talking about, there's, uh, there's patches on the list for it. Okay. So well. Oh, no. Again, we'll see in a, in a few months or years. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, so is there also ways to, uh, if you have an external clock for uh, the AC maybe, to control the clock to follow the changes in the input sample rate, so basically level out the, the clock instabilities instead of resampling. OK. Um, OK, I see your question. I can see the use case typically, for example, with a, let's say you have a SPD input interface. At some point, you will receive a signal which is at 48 kilohertz at some other point, at 96, for example. I don't think there is, I'm not sure, and I should check. But so far, I don't think there is an easy way to get the sample rate frequency. You will need to get it, and especially with a, an SPDF controller like this, you cannot just tell PyPoyer this is the same clock because it will not be synchronous, in fact. And if it changes per frequency, you, yeah, you cannot just, uh, if it can change frequency, I don't think you can just tell, say that this is the same clock. So for that use case, you would need to indeed convert it either in software or in hardware. Um, yeah, I think that, that's it. And I, you could have the information from the drivers. I know that every SPD receiver has, can be read, uh, can read the sample frequency at some point. I'm not sure how well it's integrated in the in the driver, and if you can actually get it, get the information to send it back to PyPoyer. So I don't know if that answers your question. So uh, I think it's mo more about if you have, uh, for example, uh, 96 kilo kilohertz, but your local clock is not as stable as well. It, it has different variations than the input clock. So mm -hmm. you could have, if you have a programmable PLL at the output side, you can continuously tune it to avoid the resampling. That it, 
would be possible in hardware, but I don't know if there's any support in Linux to actually do this clock control. Uh, I'm not entirely sure I understand, but I think you. <laughs> Uh, ST had some hardware for that, but it was very, very custom and non-standard. Uh, actually working out the correction you need to do is not super, it's, it's at least as much effort as doing ASRC and possibly less robust. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure how that relates to the previous question, but um, for this issue of uh, having the same sampling rates on multiple devices that don't share the same clock, I know that in professional audio setups, they tend to have this thing called the wall clock that is kind of one unified clock that you can like um, spread to different peripherals and stuff like that. Um, do you know like if uh, there is support for that uh, in the kernel and in Pipewire, if there are plans for that, stuff like that? If they have a, in the audio, we call, we call this the master clock, which is a clock that serves to derive all the other audio clocks. So indeed, if you have uh, the same master clock, even if they don't have the same nominal sample rate, they are actually synchronous, even if they are different. For example, I put, I think, uh, should be somewhere a bit, a bit before here. It's very easy to have a same clock indeed with passive components which are clock passive such as converters analog to digital converters or digital to analog again the problem is with some digital bit interface which embed their own clock in the in the in the interface so if i take for example the the spd receiver uh, there is here an i2 an i2s interface which is standard uh, where you put you can put your own clock here but you, it will not always be synchronized with the clock that is actually recovered for the interface. So you might, and you will probably, uh, miss some samples, SN, some bits. So this can indeed solve uh, some issues, especially regarding to analog uh, converters. Uh, but with digital interfaces, you cannot just use it in the same way, except if you have dedicated hardware, which indeed, uh, for example, an, an hardware synchronous uh, sample converter, which takes your own uh, master clock and then gets the APD from the other side. And there are some components like this, but it's a bit expensive, so in some applications, you might want to, to remove them altogether. OK, thanks. Um, you, so the, the, you started with saying that Pipewire is, or a sound server is necessary if you have several applications that want to access an audio device. Um, can we assume that if you just have a single application that access an audio, the audio device, for example, if you only have a an, an, uh, video conferencing application running no. uh, ever, that it's always better to uh, use ALSA directly? Or would it, is it possible that PyPower would still perform well with, uh, uh, if, if there is only a single application running? I'm going to say that the, what I expect was that using ALSA directly would have a lower overhead. Uh, to be honest, uh, I'm a lazy developer, so I'd rather use the IO level API so that also the, my application is more portable uh, to different devices. Uh, typically, this was uh, a question we had for a customer. Uh, either do we use uh, a jack sound server or do we go directly with Alza for maximum performance? But because of synchronization issues, we said if we go with Alza, we have a lot more to develop for. Indeed, we can just have a simple example uh, Alza lib client and that we use as a base uh, to then uh, pipe audio to different uh, custom system. Uh, but with Jack, at least, we know that we will be able to handle different interfaces that we will have to handle manually in Alza. How do you resample different interfaces and stuff like this? So even if it was a single application, uh, basically the application was piping audio to their custom DSP firmware, uh, we'd rather use a sound server just for the ease of having a higher level app, uh, audio application and having a known level of support for properly reading uh, one or multiple ALSA interfaces. Thank you. Okay, I think we're ready for dinner time. Thank you for the... <laughs>